everyone. I'm Dr. Yosefa Fogel Rubel, and this is One on One Women Talk Torah, a series brought to you by Matan Women's Institute for Torah Study. Welcome back to Matan's One on One Parsha podcast, where we spend about 30 minutes discussing deep thematic points about the Parsha. Our series on Bamidbar is titled Growing Pains, The Journey Towards Responsibility. Each episode explores the manner in which the Parsha reflects the maturation of the people and Moshe's leadership during the wilderness period. If you would like to sponsor a podcast episode on our memory of a loved one, please contact the Matan office via telephone or email us at podcast.matan.org.il. These sponsorships enable us to keep creating new content, so if you have deliberated until now, don't hesitate to be in touch. Parshat Shlach opens with a divine commandment to send spies to the land of Israel. Famously, when this event is recapped in the first chapter of Dvarim, it is presented as the people's initiative. Either way, the reconnaissance mission doesn't go well for the people, and their negative reporting costs them 40 years of wandering in the desert, and the generation of the exodus is punished to die there. Stricken by guilt, a group tries to reach Israel, but is quickly overcome by enemies and killed. This was too much, too late. After this, the Parsha concludes with a somewhat random grouping of laws, the commonality being that they will all be fulfilled when the people enter the land of Israel. Chazal and commentators point out that this is likely meant as a comfort to the people. They will not be able to enter the land of Israel, but their children will fulfill these laws. Among them are wine offerings and others that accompany the sacrifices, the challah piece given to the priest, sacrifices given for wrongdoing by the community, the case of the wood gatherer from which it is learned that there exists an even more severe punishment of stoning for purposeful desecration of Shabbat, and finally the mitzvah to wear tzitzit. All of these passages have been explored for their connection to the reconnaissance story that precedes them, whether they're connected linguistically, as in the word latour used by tzitzit and the spy story, or the details provided about collective sin offerings, perhaps in dialogue with the collective sin recounted at the Parsha's beginning. Today I'm joined by returning guest, Rabbanit Mali Bravsky, who teaches Tanakh and Machshavet Yisrael at Michal Mavaseret Yerushalayim, where she also serves as an in-house social worker. She maintains a clinical practice in Gush Etzion and teaches for Wurzweyer School of Social Work at Hebrew University. Mali, it's great to have you back. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. So we're going to look at the story of the spies from a different kind of perspective. I'll let you sort of define what, what that perspective is. But I think it's going to sort of really help us sort of trace the, the development, or as I said in the beginning, the maturation or the changes that the people are undergoing during this period of the wilderness. So why don't we jump into that perspective that you want to share with us today? Okay. So first of all, I love the title that you gave uh, this series, Growing Pains, The Journey Towards Responsibility, because I think um, what I want to talk about very much, I think the title uh, reflects it. So I, what I wanted to discuss was transitions. A lot of what I'm going to say is based on a theory proposed by Bruce Feiler in his book called Life is in the Transitions. And if anybody has read Brene Brown, she has a very similar type of theories in Rising Strong. But I'm going to, I'm going to keep with the language and the terminology of, of Bruce Feiler. And basically, it's a study of the experience of transitions. And I think that that's valuable for all of us to, because we're all going to have to undergo transitions as as Filer says, we're going to have things in our life that are disruptors. That happens once every six months to a year and a half. That could be a birth, a graduation, an illness, a marriage, a move. Those are life disruptors. They're very common, and we can usually manage them with, we figure it out. However, once every I don't, I don't he want says to seven it. years. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say five to ten years, mm-hmm. right? Um, something called a life quake happens, which is a disruptor that is much more profound. I, I really think the I don't even think you need to define it once you have the word life quake. Like you say, life life quake, and people go, "Aha, I know what that is." Right? It's the experience that shakes you to your core, that completely throws you off track, that you never expected, that shakes up your life, um, and that kind of demands that you have you know you really have to recalibrate. And so understanding how you navigate a life quake, um, which will also help us understand how you navigate every, any transition, I think is really helpful and I think really helps us understand what happens to Bnei Israel in the Midbar because the transition from slavery to freedom, from Mitzrayim to Eretz Israel, from Egypt to the land of Israel, Pharaoh's people to God's people, 
from dependency to to responsibility and to um, self definition and self actualization that is a life quake and so underst- I, and, I, and I think that understanding the part of the desert and understanding the part of the sin here in our parsha can really help us understand a Bnei Yisrael's experience, but then also our own experiences. I think that's a really helpful frame. And also, I, I guess I want to also remind our listeners that while the while the spy story is sort of the anchor that we that we place down as the the downfall of it all, this really started before. And Parsha Ba'alotcha is after those inverted nuns is really where we see the people starting to lose it. Moshe loses it in this Parsha. I would even say God loses it, but maybe we'll get there. And and so that sort of, that downfall, and we'll see how we define it as we continue the conversation, is something that really started before. There's something about this Parsha that you feel it kind of climaxes. Yes, It, it climaxes exactly. here. Mm-hmm. And I would say maybe the, the, the climax continues maybe in the Korach story. And, and, and then we have sort of the, the rest, right? All the rest of it. But there's a certain arc here that we sort of started rising slowly in Balotcha. We get here, we have Korach, and then and then things sort of start to, start to plateau. So okay, so let's let's continue on and see how how this frame connects to the parsha. Okay, so yeah, so I love what you just said about like it looks like they're going up and then they come down because what I'm about to do is just give a framework for how humans navigate transitions. But one of the most important things to understand is that it's not linear. It's that we have this general framework and ways in which we respond, but we, we revisit and we loop and we go back and we go forward and we get stuck. And so like the image, um, actually the image of B'nai Sol wandering in the Midbar is I think the most apt image. So that, I'll get to that in a second. So let me kind of go through the stages. So essentially, not shockingly, it's a beginning, a middle, and an end. The language that Fehler uses, which I think is the most helpful, the, the end is the long goodbye, the middle is the messy middle, and then, then you have a new beginning. And this arc, actually, I think any, anybody who, who knows anything about, let's say, the hero's journey, Joseph, Cam- Joseph Campbell's um, monomyth of the hero, or has st- done any study on how stories are told, um, knows that that's how stories are built, mm-hmm. right? There's a, you're in one world, it's a comfortable world. And then for whatever reason, you're called to transition into a new world. But you can't just jump from the old ending, the thing that's gone, into the new beginning. There has to be a messy middle. You have to go through a process from one to the other, right? It's like in every fairy tale. You've got to go through the woods. In every story, there's a middle act. You can't skip act two. You absolutely cannot skip act two. So to me, it's completely, it's so unsurprising that of course, it's like, it's almost mitbakesh. It's almost like, necessary that the Jewish people, they can't leave Mitzrayim and go right into Eretz Yisrael. Of course they have to go into the desert. And of course it has to take 40 years. And of course they're wandering around lost because that is the messy middle. The experience of the middle, it, that's the part of, of your life, right? When again, you've had your, your life quake, something has shaken you up, right? And, and you, you want to get to a, a, a new place, you're going to go through a period that's dark and scary and confusing and you feel like you've hit rock bottom and you don't know where you're going and you don't see where the light is and you're going to be wandering around lost, right? And then you might see a flicker of light and then you might go backwards um, and then you might be ready to move forward and then then you take a step back. So just... What, I'm just going to stop yeah. you for one second because mm-hmm. what, what comes out of what you just said and I think has come out of other conversations as well, is that it wasn't even a realistic expectation that this that this journey would take a few weeks. Correct. <laughs> I mean, there's something about it that you say, okay, well, we had we had the reason. We had to like hang the the reason for the 40 years on on the spy. I get that this is theologically complex, but I'm just putting it out mm-hmm. there either way. But there's something about it that we could never have gone from being slaves to being in the desert for a few days, a few weeks, and then going to Eretz Israel. There's something about it that wasn't plausible exactly. to begin with. So a little bit, I would even say, I would put it in the same category as like the sin of Adam HaRishon. Exactly. Like, it had to happen. It, totally. So we had a reason, we had the circumstance, we have the details, but but that, that curve, that arc is something that had to take place mm-hmm. almost. And I, and I love that you used that example because that's the example that I used Similarly, when I was asked the same question, which is like, so then if so, what did God expect from them? 
you know, and again, that's a whole different theological conversation and a different podcast, but like God seems to often give us like a standard we can't keep and then give, and then like we have to go through plan B, mm-hmm. right? It's, it's, as you said, it's Gan Eden, it's the story of the flood, it's Chet mm-hmm. Egel, not just Chet Maraglim, right? It's like, it's, it's the recurring story. Um, and it's an interesting theological question and about what you're saying is also ties to another point I wanted to make, which is that thinking about it from this perspective really raised for me compassion because I no longer view this sin or this experience as a failure or a fall. Right. And if only they wouldn't have done it, then things exactly. would have been better. But you say, no, I, no. I think apparently it has to happen. It's part of the story, you yeah. know, as you said, like that's right when you said the beginning and like, and I was thinking, you know, you started with Bahalotcha, but like, the story starts with Kriyat Yam Suf and then them complaining and right and like they're, they're but there's growth right you, that's kind of what you're pointing to they don't respond the same in the beginning as they do in the middle as they do in the end because there is growth even with the messy middle but because of that when I think of the Jewish people I no longer think of them as the first generation and the second generation right I think that's a very common you know they're the the failures and then they're their children who were the succeeders and I think I view them now as it's one process. And that's kind of comforting to me to view it that way. Like the big picture, okay, like it's fine. Take all the time you need. You need 40 years, take 40 years. Because um, maybe now I'll get to like the process that you have to go through. But basically, I'll go through the stages now very quickly. The first stage, the long goodbye, is when you have to accept whatever it is that you have to let go of, which means kind of processing and acknowledging the feelings. Then you've got the messy middle, right? And in the messy middle, you have to shed, you have to let go right, of old mindsets, of old beliefs, of old fears, of old insecurities. You have to try new things. You try on new ways of being, new ideas, new perspectives. Um, often mentors help you do that. And then you have to learn how to tell a new story, and then you have to learn how to live a new story, right? So what, what, this idea that the first generation failed and therefore they had to die, to me, feels much more like it's just shedding the old things, like, it's not a punishment. They didn't do anything wrong. But when you do grow, there are things you have to let go, right? There are, there are parts of you that you have to kind of shed. Yeah, but there's also a statement here about the fact that somebody may be so entrenched in something that they're not able to let it go. Right. Meaning, there's something Correct. Here, meaning we're shedding a whole generation. Yes. So meaning the, the reflection is that there's something about this particular group of people that they 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 can't they can't make that Correct. transition. It's it's beyond their capabilities. Right. It's kind of like when you come to terms with a family member yes. whose, be, whose behavior Absolutely. is really, really difficult for mm-hmm. you and you say, you know, so for many years you can you can resist it or be angry at it or fight with it, but at a certain point you accept it and say like this is who they are. Like they're not capable yes. with the with the tools they have at their disposal right now to Correct. make this kind of change. Correct. That's kind of how I look at them. Yeah, also. I, I do. I totally do. When Which is a- different than failure, by the way. Correct. It's different than it's failure. It's saying failure. they can. It's not in their capacity right. right now. That's what I'm saying. I think when you look through the eyes of compassion, you understand, and that's again what that's why to me it's about process, right? And so like the process is. Okay, this this generation couldn't do it, and 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 I, it's true that in Chazal and in in, in our Farshim and like all the commentary, there's a lot of uh, con- condemnation, yeah. you know. But I like this way better. <laughs> I like looking at it this way better, which is they couldn't. As you're saying, they couldn't do it, and therefore, uh, okay. If and if you look at the Jewish people as a larger entity, so so they had to be let go, and the new generation were the ones who were able, they were the ones who were able to let go of those mindsets and move in. And I think that that's true, as you're saying, it's true generationally, it's true nationally. Like, things things are a process and things take time. And I think, and, but the yeah. way that you're looking at it as a whole is that you're saying that we all, we have two generations you're looking at as the whole of Am Yisrael, yes. right? That, that's the piece. So that's the for me, that's the piece. Yes. And so the shedding is that generation, but it's not because I'm rejecting them and accepting exactly. them. Exactly. It's part of a big whole yeah. and that, that piece had to be shed. Exactly, okay. which is also part of what you said about the, you know the message of um, the end of of the parsha. Like it's okay, you're you're going to get there, mm-hmm. right? And even the ma'apilim that you mentioned to me is the story of the learning of the acceptance, right? It's like uh, don't don't push this. You're gonna this is not for you. Mm-hmm. Like you can't rush this experience. As you said, like once it's done, it's done. Too little, too late. You said mm-hmm. too much, too late. This process takes time, and that's okay because mm-hmm. most people don't realize how long their messy middle is going to take. And that was the, one of the other 
findings in the study. It's the tunnel where you don't get to see the light at the end. Absolutely. That's the messy middle. We can call this moment in time exactly. by many, many different names. Exactly. So how do we see this playing out really in specifically in, in this in our parsha? parsha. Okay. Yeah. So so basically I the way I see it is that Hashem and Moshe basically say to the Jewish people, Okay, it's time to transition, right? Like we finished our long goodbye, it's time for a new beginning. Okay. And what do the people say? Also B'nai Israel and also the spies, right? They're like, No, no, we can't we can't we can't do that. Why? because of the emotions that come up for us in the messy middle. It's too scary. We're not ready. There are monsters, right? They literally say there are monsters, right? Mm-hmm. There are giants there, yeah. right? Which is, again, like it make, makes me think of um, every fairy tale, or if you know that very famous uh, map of the world from the ancient times where they thought this was the end of the earth and then they wrote on it, here there be, dra- here there be dragons, right? Mm-hmm. Like, don't go there. Do not, don't go out of the known into the unknown. It's dangerous and you're gonna get killed, right? All of those feelings and all of those mindsets, I'm not good enough, I'm not strong enough, I can't do this, I'm not ready, I, I want to go back to the old ways, L- let's go back to Egypt, where, where at least I knew, and how many times do they ask to go back to Egypt? Mm-hmm. You know, at least, at least I knew that world. That's their reaction, right? And they know, they know, the Meraglim themselves, the spies themselves have been in the land of Israel, and they come back and they even say it. It's gorgeous and it's beautiful, I know the new beginning has potential, I'm too scared to go there. And then you have the mentors, which is how I view Kalev uh, and Yehoshua, right? the two spies who say, no, 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 we can do it. And, because, and I think that's also really beautiful to see. You can see the mentors either as when we go through a messy middle, often there are mentors for us, people who help us on our way. Or you can see them as another part of B'nai Israel, right? If you want to look at the Jewish people as one unit, so they've got a voice that says, we can't, it's too scary. And then they've got a voice that says, oh, maybe I can. And if you look at what they say, Kalev and Yehoshua, specifically Kalev ben Yifune, who you know, gives this speech, you see that he, he hits on three major themes that are essential to people telling a life story. Right? What does he say? Okay? He says, we can do this. Right? Don't be afraid. We can do this. Um, we belong in Eretz Israel. That's where we're supposed to be. Don't be afraid. God will be with us. Our mission is to serve God. So basically what he's saying to the people is, Try, let's try to tell a new story, right? Our story doesn't have to be that we're slaves who, you know, are not strong and we're, we're, we're just at our best are a bunch of nomads. Basically, he gives them agency, right? We can do this, right? We're strong enough. He gives them belonging, right? We can, we can let, enter the lands and become a new people. We can become a nation um, living as family and as community. And he gives them service, Right? We'll, we'll do this to serve God. So agency, belonging, and service are three major um, pillars around which we build our lives. And so he kind of gives them this new story with new, you know, a new way to shape their lives. That's how I see Kalev. And that's why, because he has that capability to see that, that's why he is able to enter the land and to lead, and Yehoshua. The people aren't able to see it. Okay. Um, I think it also points to the idea that somebody can't grow for you. Yes, and it's kind of totally. like let's let's pretend he's the therapist or he's the parent or he's the friend. So he might have a lot of wisdom, but if you're not in a place to receive that wisdom, it it's just it's going to fall yeah. on deaf ears. So mm-hmm. I think that that's also that piece of when you're going through this messy middle or you're going through a transition, you're the only one who could do it. So when, when you're ready to do it, it'll happen. And when you're not, you can meet a lot of wise people along the way, but it might not make an impact. A hundred percent. Yeah. And that's also like for me, so mentors come in all different ways, right? So so they're the like encouraging mentors, right? Mm-hmm. But there are also mentors who sometimes say like snap out of it. Yeah. You know? Like, you know, the famous scene from an old movie, which will date me, Moonstruck. She gets, I didn't see you know, it. So, so you don't have to, most people haven't, but it's a very, very famous scene where, she, where I forgot who it is, slaps somebody across the face and says, snap out of it. So like, you know, she's like, oh, I can't do this and I can't do that and I'm going to snap out of it. So I think this, to me, it helps me to see God's reaction as that, right? It's like he's trying to say to them, snap out of it. You can do it, which is why it's a strong response. But again, they're not ready. And again, we don't have to go too deeply into the theology, but like, you know, I, I'd like to believe that God has the, you know, meta 
perspective as well. And so he kind of knows <laughs> that that's how it's going to be. I guess I, how I, it's I don't be. have any answers, but I will open up and say that, that God's response here, honestly, it disturbs me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and to me, it also explains retroactively Moshe's response in the previous Parsha, meaning we see many times that Moshe and God, they're almost, they're so close that they, that they sort of enmesh with each other mm-hmm. in the reactions. And yeah. in the previous Parsha, when, when I sat with, uh, with Dr. L. Ziegler and we spoke about, you know, sort of Moshe's breakdown and like his, his inability to respond in a way that was helpful and, and what that reflected about where he, where he was at that point in time. But here you see it happening in the same regard with God. And God again does, you know, pulls this trick, which is of course part of the parallel to the, to the Chaita Egel, to the story of the golden calf, where he says, I'm done. Let's switch these people out. I don't need them. And, and, and so I, I, I'm, your theory resonates with me, but God's response in it is hard for me to pinpoint because if it was part of some broader plan or if, you know, God had this broad perspective on, on this matter, I feel like he wouldn't respond with this threat to destroy us. There's something about the dynamic that that disturbs me. I don't have an answer for it, but I sort of feel like God is breaking down the same way that Moshe is. Moshe said, I can't leave them anymore. And God says, I don't even want them anymore, right? And it's sort of like they're they're reflecting off of each other. And then here, it's of course going to be Moshe who calms down God, whereas the last time God had calmed down Moshe. But something about Hashem's response here uh, is hard, is hard for me. I think that I feel the same way, which is why like the zoom out is helpful for me. A, a partial answer that I say to myself, which I'm totally aware is, you know, I'm stacking the the deck in God's favor because I need to. I need to think of God as compassionate and all-knowing and forgiving. Even though I think there's an important piece to also remember that like there, there is the concept that like you have an opportunity and you can miss it and that that can have yeah. consequences. But Perhaps God is, you know, parallel to in the story of the golden calf, a lot of commentators say, you know, as opposed to like Noah and similar to Avraham, God is giving Moshe the opportunity. He wants Moshe to step up and say this, right? So maybe there's a piece there. And again, like it's, it's the eternal mystery of we don't understand God and his responses um, that we have throughout the whole Torah. I, I regret that I cre- that I created the nation of the flood with God. Doesn't you're saying it's a little bit like maybe it's staged anger so that so that God either, so that Moshe will will step up and defend the people. Either yeah, either it's staged anger or there's a because God is infinite. There's a piece that's real and that has a message in it, and then beyond that, it it really makes me think of like the Ain Sof in the Sfirot. I don't know how we just got into the okay. place of Kabbalah, uh, Kabbalah but like. <laughs> God has so many layers. His knowledge has so many layers. His truth has so many layers, right? If, if like, the reason we can't understand God is because he's infinite and beyond us. So we can't understand maybe, you know, the language that he chooses to express himself in. We can hope and, and the way that he seems to run the world that we certainly can say. We can't understand that the way in which he, but the same way that we can say, I don't understand like what Ganeidin was just a setup. And then you could say, no, maybe not. Maybe it was supposed to be that way for a larger reason. You know, the human entity was meant to sin, fall, come back, have something to strive for. I feel like it's the same thing here. Like I can't really understand it again when I'm in high resolution. But when I zoom out, I can fade into the fu- the fuzzy big picture and kind of hang my hat or hope on these things that I do know. About God, yeah, you know, mm-hmm. like okay, I don't understand, but at sorts, I mean, Paolo, whatever that means, you know, yeah, yeah, okay. So we'll just we'll we'll leave that as it is. Yeah, so in, in the zoom in, there's something there that for sure that is a wrinkle, and and the zoom out that we yeah. can we just assume that important for us to realize because that's our lives is living with these questions. Yeah, totally. So the final stage is um, is the new beginning, right? And in the new beginning, you again you've shed what you've needed, you've unlearned what you need to unlearn, and you've learned what you needed to, to learn. And now you have a new story. Now you have a new perspective. Um, maybe you've reshaped your life mission. Maybe you have a new cause. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, this is also from Failer. There are these three kind of life meanings that we have: agency, which is like can be our work it can be you know how we express ourselves in the world right it's the kind of 
our self-expression, our self-actualization. There's belonging, which is connection and relationships. And then there's cause, which is higher service, right? Service to God, service to others. And it could be that, like, our, we thought our life was going in one direction and that, like, you know, our life's meaning was about agency, let's say, right? It's like, you know, I'm going to be the best CEO. And then something happens. Let's, you know, these examples in this book, let's say somebody whose life was upended when their child was diagnosed with an illness. And then it shifted and it became more about the family um, and then it became about a cause, right? The person, let's say, rededic- rededicates his life to something new. And so I think that that's also a big, to me at least, that was a big takeaway was if we keep our eyes on the ball, like, okay, I have to figure out the shape of my life. And I didn't expect this curveball, right? And, and Fiedler calls them monster curveballs, which I think is a great expression. And it's going to take a long time for me to shed what I have to shed learn new um, mindsets, new perspectives, new truths, new reality. I, I'm going to have to reckon, right? That's a Brene Brown word, right? I'm going to have to rumble and reckon with my emotions, learn how to handle them, learn how to hold them, and learn to forgive, learn to set boundaries. I'm going to have to learn so many things. When I come out the other side, I'll probably have a new story to tell, right? I'll, my, the shape of my life will become clearer to me, whether it's the same shape as it was before, whether it's a new shape, whether the cause is the same, whether the balance is shifted a little bit, but I'm, 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 I can come out with a new story. I'll be able to tell a new story. The new story for Ami Sorel here is that... Is entering the land. They can. They, they can conquer. Yeah. They can go in. Yeah. They're capable. Yeah. Yeah, the, 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 to me, the new story, the, it's like tell the new story, which is we can do this and then live the new story. So mm-hmm. to me, living the new story is entering the land. And so for me, Sefer Bab Midbar is really that, right? Like Sefer Bab Midbar is the messy middle and then it ends literally on the threshold, right? That's where it ends on the Arvot uh, Hayardain, on the fields of Moab. And all of Devarim is just kind of Moshe being their mentor and telling them, you know, aspects of how to do this new beginning. And then they enter. I think they, also they the, live a the few wars that they do fight in the desert yeah. after this are also mm-hmm. part of that that awareness that they can yes. do this, right? Yeah. It's not that they had to go in and then the first time that they meet war or mm-hmm. adversary as these new newly yes. birthed people uh, is in is in Israel, but they actually have that experience in the desert Absolutely. as well, which is probably also really important. Yeah, which shows also like it's not linear. Like you take yeah. a step into the new world, you have these minor challenges, and and you prepare yourself, you practice, and then you you know before you're ready to actually, you know, kind of find that revolution. I think that this frame is really important because, again, as we sort of titled this series about the process of maturation, for many people that takes all different shapes throughout their life. And for some people, maturation is a word that they associated with, you know, their teenage years. Or, But the one we're speaking about today is that maturation happens at all different times in life and that it happens multiple times. And there's multiple periods in one's life where, well, they'll say, oh, that, that was a tremendous period of change and growth. Yes. And I wouldn't have asked for it. I wouldn't have mm-hmm. invited it in. But that, that's, how, that's how life happened. And we can choose to fight it or resist it, or we can choose to, to grow with it and, yeah. then, and then basically become bigger, better versions yeah, exactly. of ourselves than we were before it happened. Mm-hmm. And again, to me, the word I keep coming back to is compassion. Because like, when you end up in a messy middle, at a stage in life that you didn't expect to be in a messy middle. Yeah. Wait a second, I'm an adult. I'm whatever it is, right? Anything. It could be someone's divorce. It could yeah. be someone's loss, death of a loved one. So right? many. There, there are so many examples. So many. <laughs> um, and then we're like, wait a second, why, why can't I handle this? Or like, why is my life not pursuing, you know, like a line- the linear yeah. way that I expected it? It's mm-hmm. like, you're not crazy. You had a life quake and now you're in a messy middle. You're yeah. not crazy. This is hard. Life is hard and this is completely normal. And have, you know, I think the best the best way to go through it is to have that self-compassion and that self-awareness and that self-understanding that will give you the strength to go through the woods. But again, there's no story unless you go through the woods. Yeah. You know? It, it reminds me a little bit, uh, again, in totally, totally different language, where I remember it in his, it's in his Haggadah, but Rabbi Sachs speaks about how time in the Western conception is linear, and that leads to optimism, which leads to hubris. Mm -hmm. Whereas he speaks about how time in the Jewish conception is circular, and it creates Mm -hmm. hope. 
and it's totally different language. Those are beautiful. But I think that it's a related concept because Absolutely. when you are aware of the fact that life doesn't have an upward trajectory and it keeps going that way. And again, I think I think most of us as we grow older, we experience these life quakes. So we're 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 people have already identified in their life, I'm sure, as we've been speaking about, you know, what moments these were and there probably will be more of them for all of us. And uh, and so once you realize that, so you realize that there's work that simply is sort of spread out over over a lifetime. And and if you've already come out of that tunnel once, I think it leaves you with hope that even when something comes in the future that was nothing you could have predicted that you'll be able to come out of it again. Yeah, that's the word. The word. That's the word that Which I to me is, said to me. Hope it's a story is far more hope. compassionate than optimism. Optimism yes. to me is very annoying. By I, the way, I love that. <laughs> I love that. This, I was like, you just gave me such a beautiful gift of that, Rabbi uh, Sachs. It's it's exactly right. Yeah. Optimism leads to hubris. Everything's going to be great. My life's yeah. going to be great. It's going to be one. It also leads to know, lack of stage. validation for what people are going through. Absolutely. Meaning, oh, it'll be better. It's yeah. A positive or what did they do wrong? If uh, right? No, that's also the toxic positivity. Exactly. exactly. And this is. I love that. Language. That like no, this is about what did you say? You said it was that it leads to time. cyclical time cyclical leads to hope. Leads to hope. Cyclical, yeah. cyclical time leads to hope. Absolutely, because it's not that cyclical time leads nowhere. Yeah. It's that it leads to hope and to growth and to spirals rather than a staircase. Yeah. Thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you. I hope you've enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. I'm Dr. Yosefa Fogel Rubel, and this is One on One Women Talk Torah a series brought to you by Matan Women's Institute for Torah Study. Please do one-on-one and women's Torah learning a small favor by sharing this podcast with family and friends so that we can reach new listeners. You can stream and download these episodes on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, SoundCloud, and Matan's website. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review in the comments. Please send us any feedback at podcast at matan.org.il. That's podcast at matan.org.il. Thanks for listening, everyone.